say hello. Welcome to our first uh, King's Entrepreneurship Lab event. How many of you have been to the visit us at the eLab, been to one of our events? Put your hands up. Oh, brilliant. That's, uh, that, for, the, for the rest of you, take your phone out, scan that QR code, and then you, you will know some amazing events that we're coming up. Actually, the next one is this, this Thursday. Uh, and then we have a bunch of uh, events programmed for, uh, for the rest of the term, actually for the rest of the six months. So it's a great pleasure to, I'm not going to talk for very much, but it's a great pleasure to have um, Jay Clayton and uh, Gillian Tett with us tonight. And uh, I'm going to let them, they don't need introductions, uh, but I'm going to let them take over and use the whole hour. One thing I want to tell you is those of you who've been to the eLab, or eLab events, know that we generally tend to give out a little gift. And today's gift is this book. And this book, we have three copies. We have, we have more than three, but three copies that will go out. They're on the piano there. They, they will be signed by Jay. And they will be to the people asking the best questions. Okay. And I've got three. Oh, you three volunteer. Thank you so much. <laughs> so you can choose the best questions. How does that sound? I will give you one book each. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, it means you can't win the book yourself. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank, thank, thanks very much for joining us, and over to you, Jillian. Well, thank you very much, Jillian Caviar. And I am delighted to be here today. Um, I think most of you know that I have just started as the 45th Provost of King's College. My amazing predecessor, um, Mike Proctor, is over here. And in fact, the eLab started on his watch. And I'm delighted to be here for the eLab because what this is really championing, and it started, I think, three years ago, um, is not so much entrepreneurship in the sense of trying to turn everyone into Elon Musk, heaven forbid, but rather the entrepreneurial mindset, a willingness to challenge norms, to challenge the status quo, to not just accept things the way they are, to try and remake the world, whether that's in business or in technology or in social um, infrastructure, However you want to remake the world, that's really what we're trying to champion um, in this project. And I can't think of a more interesting person to come and talk to us than, given his official name, Mr. Walter J. Clayton III, um, who, if you look at his biography, is extraordinarily impressive. He was formerly at the SEC from 2017 to December 2020. Um, he's been a long-standing luminary on Wall Street um, in the legal world at the center of many of the most critical deals that happened in the 2008 financial crisis. He was one of the linchpins of what was going on then um, in, you know, just to name but one of them, Barclays acquisition of Lehman Brothers during that period. He's had a very long and storied legal career. Um, but what I find most interesting are three things. Firstly, you grew up in the shadow of Willy Wonka your father worked at Hershey Chocolate Factory. So for those of you who don't know, you literally grew up surrounded by chocolate, which is wonderful. Um, looking for your bio, you were at one stage, you were actually an official ocean mountain, sorry, ocean rescue team or someone. You were actually Baywatch um, diving, into the, um, diving into the oceans to rescue people in the summers in lifeguard. So we can send you into the can if we have problems. Um, <clears throat> but also perhaps most importantly, you were a king's man. Um, you came here under a special exchange program, spent two years doing an MPhil, a master's or? No, I did a BA. A BA, sorry, a BA in economics. Um, and have since said to me, and in fact, we know each other for some time in New York, that you found this one of the most intellectually stimulating times of your whole career. So we have a lot to talk about. Quickly to ask, who else here is an economist or been studying economics? Quite a lot of you, okay, right. So they're gonna keep you honest. Um, let's start by asking, you know, you came here back in 1987, was that when you were 86? 88, 88. okay, so you matriculated in 88. Why Kings? Because Kings is not an obvious breeding ground for a Wall Street lawyer. <laughs> Least of all one who worked in the Republican administration. I'm gonna to come to that in a minute. Looking through the catalogs, it, it had the best economists. The best. Yeah. Still does. Yay! <laughs> and, and that's it. It had, it had the best economists. And, and then um, when I got here, it turned out that, you know, 
great, you know, great supervisions, great lectures. But my fellow students were really, you know, a lot of fun to work with. It was not, I was, it was not a monastic study of economics. It was very much a collaborative study of economics, which was terrific. Right. And do you remember the particular themes in the economics um, profession that you were studying at the time? Well, it was the rise of game theory and mm -hmm. use of game theory to explain um, why markets fail and how you, and also how you design regulation to fix market failures. So if you understand the, the game theory, you can change regulation to change the payouts. That was that was on in the emergency. I know you guys, the rational expectations was a big part of it because we could come out of inflation, right? How do you keep inflation under control when expectations? And I was walking by Jim Trevithick's um, earlier, and I was like, wow, he's writing it, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> About inflation, yeah. So those of you who haven't yet studied Jim Trevithick, go and do it because it's incredibly relevant right now. But um, so you did economics. Um, what did you do for fun when you were at King's other than economics? <laughs> Do I have to tell all of it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sport. Right. Sport. You were a big rugby player, weren't you? A lot of, a lot Kings isn't exactly famous for its rugby prowess. Okay. <laughs> the football team wasn't bad. Right. The football team wasn't bad. We, 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 and, uh, and then a, a fair amount of time in, in the bar and in, in hall. Mm -hmm. like some of the best times were eating dinners, eating, eating breakfasts. Right. Uh, Doing things after dinner. Right. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, that's still the great the great power of the colleges is the fact it forces people to collide and interact from different it's subjects different. and yes. yeah. And, and debate. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's wonderful. So you did your two years economics degree. Did you ever think about going into economics as a profession or oh I did. Um, I went back to um, University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. that makes change. I thought about getting a PhD in, in finance. Um, and the as life goes, I, I actually didn't get a job. Right. And so I sort of was working and going to law school and ended up as a lawyer. And but always had always had sort of economics on my mind. Right. So you then became a lawyer and you then specialized in financial deal making. Um, given your background study of game theory and the failure of the market or markets, um, what went wrong in 2008, in your view? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that's a lot. Of and I'm going to ask you how you tried to fix it or how you didn't no, try to fix it later. But, yeah. A lot of things went wrong. We got, we, the United States, got really addicted to using the housing market as a source of stimulus. So, at, you know, go back in time. That you could lever your home, you know, if you needed 20% equity or 25% equity in your home. We whittled that down and whittled that down. Each time you whittle it down, you put stimulus into the economy. You, know, you basically kept changing the rules and changing the rules to put stimulus into the economy. So we had a way over levered housing market. It was also short on supply because we, we stimulate the heck out of housing at the federal level and we restrict the heck out of it at the local level. You know, you can't build, but, we, but we're stimulating that. They need, it's, zoning is tough. So that all happened. And then to really juice it, we turned Wall Street on. So not people like you. People, and luckily I, luckily, I was able to testify that I had never done a housing deal. Right. <laughs> but uh, that, and that's what happened. Right. And like any bubble, uh, when it burst, the ripple effects were more than people expected particularly when you have a credit bubble first. And were the regulators at fault for the 2008 crisis? Well, the, the 2008 crisis is a great example of a blame game. So first people were blaming the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, the, the government-sponsored entities that facilitated lending into the housing market. Um, and then they were blaming the banks. And there was blame going around with everything. Not wrecking, look, you're supposed to be risk managers, whether you're in the government or you're in the private sector, part of your job is to be a risk manager. People didn't recognize these risks. What was fascinating, and I was just in the discussion the other day, is, okay, falls apart in September of 2008. There's kind of the aftermath, post-mortem, how are people looking at it? 
And the financial institutions made the mistake of each one saying, I wasn't as bad as that guy. So financial institution said, A said, I'm not as bad as you know, church because B, financial institution B said, I'm not as bad as you. Well, the public and the regulators, they hear that as you're all bad. And the mindset changed and you know, financial institutions came in to, you know, basically disrepute them as a result. Um, Everyone they, loved to hate the banks. And I think they've been, they've been trying to climb out ever since. So did you, when you were on Wall Street, looking at the failure of regulation in some ways um, and a systemic failure in finance, did you ever imagine you'd actually end up in charge of that? No. So, <laughs> so how? Not, not at all. So how did it happen? Because um, you weren't exactly, uh, you know, the, the chronology is you're very, you know, by this stage, by 20, 2019, you were a big figure on Wall Street. Um, you know, you've been campaigning to try and make finance safer, and then up popped Donald Trump. Tell us, tell us how it happened. Uh, so Trump wins the election in early November of 2016. Uh, in early December, uh, a client called and said, uh, I'm going up to see the transition team. Would you go with me? So I said, sure. Um, and and they, the, the question we put on the table was a was a good question. One of any of you are ever involved or, you know, uh, in administration of any kind, what can we do in the first hundred days to demonstrate that we know what we're doing? Like, how can we how can we make it clear that from you know running the economy point of view, we understand the problems and the strength of the economy we're on? So we had a nice conversation. And I thought that was it. Um, and then another contact I had. And you weren't actually a registered Republican, I I remember at the time. No, I'm, I I had no I've never had a party affiliation. Yeah, yeah. So this is yeah. part of the strange way that Washington works. Yes. Um, and then uh, uh, another another contact. One thing led to another, and I was asked if there was any job that I would want, and I did didn't really say yes. Then I came back and I said, okay, there's one job that I think I could do well that I would want, and that's chairman of the SEC. And that's that's how it happened. And when you were in office, as I understand it, I mean, you were kind of left yourself. I mean, you came in as an independent. I don't think Donald Trump knew very much about financial regulation, did he? Um, did he ever <laughs> did he ever did he, did he ever try and tell you what to do? I'll answer the first one and then the second. Um, on the first one. You know, he did understand credit because he kept going state, bankrupt. Yeah, real estate is all about it. Yeah. Credit and money. So, and he also understood the other thing. And a lot of these jobs is actually dealing with your foreign counterparts and not understanding them. So that was pretty easy. Um, but by and large, if things are going well, the management style was to leave you alone. <laughs> so some locks, maybe some other things. Things went well. So, you know, I was pretty much left to my to my own devices. Yeah, well, I remember actually going into the White House as a journalist um, soon after Donald Trump had arrived. And we asked him a lot of questions. We had a lot of time with him, bizarrely. And at one stage I asked him about financial regulation. And he sort of started looking for his Diet Coke and wanted to change the subject. So um I think, yeah, there wasn't a lot of guidance there, but we, well, one thing though to, to recognize is financial our our capital markets are we're, we're good mostly for good I, I have no problem with you know, some large percentage of them. they are some of the most regulated parts of society by by far um for good reason I mean because because look capital markets touch everything we do you know from any kind any kind of thing you finance even even financing your phone, line, which is you know effectively a thirty day financing arrangement, all the way through to you know homes, student loans, like it touches everything. So at the consumer level, it should be higher, but it's you know. Yes, indeed. But so once you get into the top job, you're in charge of the world's biggest capital markets. You're trying to stop them blowing up again. You know that the last lot did did pretty badly on that front. 
what did you actually do? And how did you try and make capital markets work better and be more safe? And how did you how did your Cambridge training in game theory help you on that? <laughs> did you go back to your old economics professors and ask them for help? I use it, I use it every day. Yeah. I really do. I use it every day. So um, you know, on the on how do you make them better? Real competition where markets don't fail makes things a lot better. So I, I say that this way to people. Um, well, the markets roughly have um, they have a market. Let's say let's say they have two hundred trillion in equity and, and and credit. I say let's really underestimate the amount of middle class money in the market. Just people who, you know, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars makes a difference in their retirement. It's probably ten trillion dollars more. If you save half percentage point on that investment, that's fifty billion dollars a year, year after year after year. So if, if by through competition you can drive the cost of investing down by half a percent, that's an incredible amount of money because back in the economy. As a comparison, the SEC brings more cases than anybody else in the world. In fact, more than the rest of the world combined. More enforcement cases. Enforcement yeah. Cases. The amount of money they get in enforcement is around $4 billion a year. So less than a tenth of what you can do if you save people half a percent. Right. And and spreads used to be, you used to pay 4% on the way in an investment and 4% on the way out and something along the way. Shrinking that down, the less than a percent on the way in, sort of nothing along the way, less than a percent on the way out, that all occurs for the benefit of investors. So, I mean, when the Silicon Valley Bank debacle happened and we had that big shocking freeze in the markets this spring, you know, there was a chorus of voices on the left saying that actually regulation on the banks had been rolled back too far and that the system was more dangerous as a result. I mean, do you think hey, the anybody who pointed to Silicon Valley Bank and said that was a joke? <laughs> Why? Absolutely. Because Silicon Valley Bank failed for the reasons that so no, Silicon Valley had, had, had plenty of capital. Yeah. Okay. How, however you measure capital, they had plenty. Silicon Valley Bank failed because of a liquidity mismatch, which is in many ways why financial institutions failed. Had absolutely nothing to do with the what well, was claimed to be a rollback of Dodd Frank, but mm -hmm. also a total Frank. Right. The, the adjustments to Dodd Frank, I would argue, actually made Dodd Frank more effective. That's 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 my view, but I was you know I was there for it. Um, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank is they just had a whole pot. They had a whole pile of deposits that people can withdraw anytime they want. Let's say you have a hundred deposits, people can just and they took that hundred dollars from the deposits and they bought long dated treasuries. So treasuries that were, you know, maturing in three years. When interest rates went up, that hundred dollars worth of treasuries was now worth ninety, and people could still pull out a hundred dollars. That's that problem is as old as bad. And, they, and they just plain screwed up. Yeah, it's not that's... really about it. There was nothing new at Silicon Valley Bank except the speed with which it happened. And that was down to this, wasn't it? The extraordinary yeah. Twitter storm and social media amplifying the panic overnight. And the, and the people who had excess deposits at Silicon Valley Bank, it's not just down to the phone, it's the fact that they were phone sat. Absolutely. But we saw, you know, the panic in the UK around the LDI <laughs> pension problems earlier. Um, so I'm just curious, you know. And that was a similar problem, right? It was indeed a similar problem, yeah. I mean, the pension funds didn't have cell phones to start tweeting about their problems, but you had that same kind of self-reinforcing mechanism in the markets where everyone started to panic and you had a snowball effect very fast. Same thing. You had, you had, you had someone who was dropping in value and you had borrowed against it. And if it dropped any further, um, the borrowers would see. And so it was that same that same liquidity mismatch. You just couldn't sell things. So, so I'm curious. I mean, given that we're now at a moment in economic history where we've got a really big change in the interest rate regime. And it looks as if we're gonna have higher rates for a long time. Do you think the financial system today is safer? Are you expecting more financial crises to happen um, as a former regulator? 
do I think the financial system is safer today than it was 20 years ago? Or go back to the 1880s, you know, 140 years ago? Absolutely. Do I think that we have solved financial crisis? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, there, there are all sorts of things that could cause us to have financial stress again. A pandemic. We had, we had a pandemic. We said we're going to shut the economy. People got very nervous that they were not going to have enough cash. And everyone sold their treasury securities. Treasury securities, U.S. Treasury securities, the safest security in the world. There were no buyers. We stopped the panic because the Federal Reserve said, we'll buy them. So, you know, the Federal Reserve had to inter intervene or we would have had a crisis. Um, and that's, you know, that was just, what, you know, two and a half years ago? So, yes. Three years ago. Um, that, so, I, I think people, people who believe you've solved too big to fail or you've solved the financial crisis, they're actually doing a really bad job. You asked me about what did I do? I woke up every day worried that there was leverage in the market I didn't see, that there was some kind of liquidity mismatch that we didn't see. Um, you know, we call, we call and ask people around Wall Street, like, what are you seeing? Um, are there pockets of stress? Um, because you never know. If, if you knew where it was going to come from, it would have happened. Yes. Or else you'd trade it and be rich in advance. Yeah. But, um, but people do that. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and you often prosecute them. But um, in terms of sort of um, the lesson from all this, I mean, what do you think this means for the economics profession? Because, you know, back in 2008, the economists were as shocked as everyone else. And I'm curious, you know, now you, you learned your economics here, you went forth and tried to put it into practice in a deal making capacity. And then you basically ended up trying to put game theory into practice to shape regulation. I mean, how has that left you feeling about the economics profession? Yeah, you know, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, it's a really important profession. It's possible with a lot of extremely bright minds. Um, I, would, I would offer two pieces of advice. Um, I don't know if you, humility is the right word, um, uh, but understand that there's more uncertainty than you think. In, 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 in how things are going to work out and be less driven by politics. The, the economics profession, at least in the public commentary, has been, here's my political view. Now let me use some economic modeling and you know, kind of, to, to prove that that view is correct, rather than saying, okay, there's, there's something here that we don't really understand. Why is it happening? Mm. Um, I, I teach a course, and I, I actually had. I, I didn't. Mention, I should have mentioned that you teach at Wharton, so um, sure. yeah. I, I I won't I won't say who it is, but an economist wrote something in you know night. I, I would say uh, 20, 20 oh seven, and then wrote the exact opposite thing in twenty twenty. So I give it to the students. Is that Larry Summers by any chance? Just taking a really wild guess. <laughs> Since I had to la I had to edit Larry Summers' columns for many years, um, I'm familiar with the detours in his perceptions. So yeah. We have been wrong repeatedly about the effects of monetary policy on the economy, and there's not a whole lot of questions about why. Right? Just well, maybe we'll do that, maybe that, but why has it taken so long? For mon monetary policy, the most aggressive monetary policy we've had in history in terms of how quickly we have raised interest rates, why has it taken so long to tamp down demand? Mm -hmm. You don't hear people talk about that, but that's that's a really interesting question. Yes. You know, I, th I think it's I think it's because structure of the economy is far different today than it was the last time we were fighting inflation. In what way? Um, so if, if you're fighting inflation by trying to reduce demand, look at how much demand is fixed. And in our economy today, through government transfers, public, public um, I, I say, should say private sector um, fixed, demand is pretty fixed in a lot right. of ways. So it's very hard for interest rates to you know, bring down to something that's already fixed. I think that's right. And then, you know, um, the transmission the transmission system is not necessarily through 
to the labor market as it once was. That's it's very that's interesting that people are now, you know, people people are going back to work. Mm. I believe they're going back to work in anticipation of it being harder to get a job six months from now. Interesting. So everyone's scared of potentially losing their jobs. I mean, those are really big questions for the economics profession to be looking at. Because that, that's not yeah. what the models will tell you. Not at all. And also the models for the central banks and mostly economics profession uses are based on demand fluctuations, not supply fluctuations. And of course, during COVID, it was all about supply. Um, sorry, I realize not all of you are economists, and so we can geek out on this for a long time, but um, but it's um, a really important question. So I certainly hope the next... Tell you, I think down the road, it's going to be harder to get a job. I got to go get one now. So somewhere out there, we need some more PhD students to study on this in their economics um, department and start looking at this quite seriously. I mean, it's a fascinating topic. Um, I've got two other areas I want to touch on, and then I want to create plenty of time for the audience to ask questions. The first question is the nature of capital markets in America versus the UK. Um, we just had, you know, this homegrown company, almost homegrown company, Arm, announce that it's not going to list in the UK but in America. Why? Is America, in your view, still more attractive? Why does it have a longer track record of creating startups and you know, other forms of early stage um, <clears throat> capital formation? And what can the UK do to copy it? What would you tell the next government, whoever they may be? Um, so it's, it's, it's hard because capital begets capital. The more, the more you have capital, and the more investors you have, the more participants you have, the more attractive you are for, for the new entry, right? So what, you know, that, that kind of ecosystem. How did the US get this ecosystem? Um, it is one of the few places where people are willing to take after-tax dollars and put them into risky assets. So you have a venture market that is entirely driven by people willing to take after-tax dollars and put them at risk. That's a sort of you know, what I what I would say. So instead of, build, instead of building their home in the Tuscany or whatever else, they keep investing they keep obsessively investing. in angel investing and that kind of thing. Then you know why, why else has the US been working? He made good bets on the industries that are now in our ascendancy, you know, tech, aerospace, healthcare. And I would say, you know, one of the reasons why Cambridge is a pretty fertile ground is and 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 human capital. You know, yeah. You know, high end education that's going to drive innovation and development. So the US was very fortunate that it invested deeply and early in all of those things. Um, so what would I say? You know, pick those areas, facilitate risk capital through tax, you know. Tax policy, tax policy, and, and the like, um, and continue to and continue to develop what they're doing here. Not for middle class people who believe that you know innovation. The cool thing about tech and the proof is you actually are seeing the future, mm. right? You're trying you're trying to imagine what the future looks like, and then come up with the product that drives you there. Yes, that's a pretty that's a pretty neat. No, it's amazing. I mean, Cambridge is. I've just been blown away just in the first week of being here by the sheer wealth of intellectual capital and amazing cutting edge research and brilliant minds and ideas. I mean, it's just incredible. It's like being a kid in a candy shop, if you're curious. I think, um, I think Cambridge has been seeing the future for centuries. Hmm. Sort of had a mindset of, okay, what's the future going to look like? Yes, well, I think putting solar panels on the chapel roofs is part of that. It's a very physical symbol of that, but um, even if the Daily Telegraph doesn't like it, but... Um, I think it's a good, it's, it's, you know, shows how one can reboot some of the history for the future. Um, but um, one other quick question before we turn to the audience for questions. Um, China, US decoupling. Now, you have gone and given quite a bit of testimony and spoken about this quite a bit about the interdependence of the US and China and China and Europe. You know, Cambridge prides itself on being an international hub. What is your view about where? that is going and where it should be going? Um, well, from starting with that, from an economic perspective, I, I don't think there is a recognition of how deeply interdependent US, China, US 
if it, it's not bilateral, it's multilateral or something. Okay. But if but if we were to have a sharp decoupling, a COVID-like you know, ceasing of, of trade or ceasing of capital flows, the you know, the welfare effects would be enormous. Now we just gotta understand that as sort of the baseline before we stumble into something that you know we stumble into a problem. Uh, do do we like where we are? Probably not. But understanding where we are, I think, is a is a is a is a good start for all parties participating. Um, also, if you're going to, you know, look, if, if the decision is on a national security, um, foreign relations, geopolitical level, if we're too dependent on China, well, you know, understanding where you are and having a very direct conversation about that is is going to be much more effective than sort of where we are right now. Right. So does that mean you think we are going to decouple more or not decouple more, or we can't afford to decouple? Uh, I think that if the Chinese government or the US government or any government is going to use the fact that they're interdependent as leverage, you need to reduce that leverage. Okay, so it's a way of saying you do think that they should try and ring fence more. Or, or stop the economic threats. Right. Well, that sounds easier said than done, but right. um... <laughs> the, the problem, it's like most things, you know, the problem isn't that hard to understand. Yeah. The solutions are there. Well, that's why we need people like you as regulators. So, um, <laughs> but um, right. Well, listen, let's turn to questions. As I, as we look around for the microphone, um, I'm going to ask you one other quick question as we, as people prepare. If you're a betting man, what's the odds that one Donald Trump runs in 2024? And two that he wins. He, he's run. He's already run. Yeah. Uh, I let's put it this way. I mean, you know, people watch the betting lines. Mm -hmm. You know, that's money. People. Yeah, the betting money. markets. Yeah. And the betting markets have Donald Trump getting the Republican nomination. Yeah. And they did not have it with any great certainty six to nine months ago. Let's yes. Say months ago. So. And if he gets a Republican nomination and he has to be presumed to be the lead candidate at the moment, do you think he wins the election? I think that what, what's the what's the term that the economists use? I think you have to run a lot of Monte Carlo analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the other candidate? What happens? What it's going to be a very interesting. It's going to be a very interesting twelve months. Well, roll on more game theory. Questions? We have. I don't know how. I've not done this before, so I don't know exactly how we organize it. Um, let's try and let's start with you in the front row because you actually had the courage to sit in the rough front row. So it would be it would be courteous, not compulsory, to identify yourself um, and keep the question short because I can already see a forest of hands. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That was very interesting. My name is Anita Aryan. I'm in the social science, but also in IT. Like, so I think yeah, you have to use the purple box. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I'm Anaita Aryan. I am a CRA, so College Research Associate at King's. Um, my question is building up on the question uh, regarding China and the United States. So how are you going to solve it when China owns still so many treasury bonds and basically can kill off the do dollar and kill itself at the same time. But so th this decoupling, how it, so, it doesn't seem to me to be really in easy at all. The, uh, uh, the decoupling, I think you would be much more concerned about the supply chain, particularly uh, critical materials. Um, you know, there's not, a, for example, there's not a lot of aluminum production in, in North America because it's, it's very dirty. We don't do it. Um, but on the treasury bonds, I think they're holding some treasury bonds. Somebody better than my I think the Chinese holding treasury bonds is below. It's not as significant. It's, it's as like yeah. now. Yeah. It's a smaller, it's smaller than we're, Japan. We're, we're, uh, we're going to sell, sell more next month than they are. Yeah, I think foreign, foreign. I, I think that's kind of right. So, um, but it was a worry. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, sometimes when things are worries, they they have a way of being demons to the time. I think that was that one's fairly easy. Um, we we got to sell a lot of treasury bonds now. <laughs> yeah, there are other reasons to worry about treasury bonds other than China right now. Uh, many, many other reasons to worry about treasury bonds. 
Um, we have a question here. Yeah, yeah. Hello, my name is Hao Shi Wang. I'm a mathematics student in Cambridge as well. And actually, my question is kind of follow up from the last question. Oh, sorry. Um, do you think uh, right now China is kind of experiencing something? I mean, Wall Street call it like a financial crisis, also caused by this housing market, right? So, do you think it's like a uh, do you find any similarity between what happening right now and the two thousand and eight? And do you have any suggestion to cope up with this problem? Well, I think it's just, I think it's because politicians, U.S. politicians, politicians everywhere, the the intoxication that comes from a rising housing market is just too much. It, it, it just, it touches everybody. Everybody feels better. They consume. And I think we saw a lot of that in China, that, that the continuing elevation of housing prices put money in consumers' pockets, and it was a real driver of the economy. And it's probably run away, but not probably, it's pretty clear. Now the question is, how do you get out of it? And what is what is the Chinese government do to get out of it? Um, I think that you would give the U.S. post two thousand and eight kind of a a B, not an A. Um, we did some things well. We didn't, you know, but we didn't give enough mortgage relief. No, it's very hard to run an economy when somebody is living in a house that's worth a hundred. And they have debt of 130. That's a really bad place for an economy to be. Wiping out that $30 of debt is 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 a really good thing for the for the economy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I, that, I mean, I know that's very simple, but if I were advising the Chinese government, it'll be my help. They, they know what they're doing. But, 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 but I would say just think about that. That that $30 of negative equity in your home is just a terrible place for any consumer to be. I have one tiny thing to add on that, which is that the first book I ever wrote was about the Japanese financial crisis, and I lived, breathed, and ate um, Japanese collapsing banks in the 1990s. And after I wrote it, um, I found out about a year later it had become a bestseller in China without me ever actually having sold the copyright. Um, someone had literally just, you know, had translated it and sold it. Um, but on the back of that, I had a stream of Chinese officials who turned up to see me and essentially asked me how to not be Japan. And the one thing I learned from that is the Chinese officials are very extremely good at studying other countries and how they screwed up, including America, to try and avoid it. So I'm sure there's a little team of people in Beijing studying you and what you did at the SEC to try and think about how they carry on their policy in the future. Have you been to Beijing um, at all? No. Right. Well, wow. right. Interesting. Any more questions uh, over there? Yeah. I want to get to as many of you as I can. And you can all come and mob him afterwards. I can see one over oh. there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jack Kurtz, uh, Queens College, uh, and Phil and Econ. Just had a question on, um, you know, how you view the increase in you know, risk management within banks post GFC and like how that um, you know, is potentially affecting, you know, shift towards private credit and how people are maybe going off from the standard rails of, uh, you know, financial services and maybe using sort of, we'll call it like dark pools, uh, dark pools. So it's a polite, polite way of asking, is the next financial crisis actually going to happen outside the banks? Yeah. So it's, it's a, a, it's a good question. question. And, and uh, it goes back to what they really said about um, what, what does the U.S. have that maybe Europe and Asia don't have in terms of their capital markets. Um, this is this is how how it is roughly in Japan, Asia, ninety percent of credit comes from banks. In Europe, it's about seventy five, and twenty five percent comes from non bank and providers. In the U.S., it's thirty percent comes from bank, and seventy percent. It's it's a but it's a nimble form of credit. Why, why has that happened? One of the drivers was exactly what you said. If you if you limit the amount of credit that banks can provide, you're either gonna have to shrink the economy or find credit somewhere else. And like people talk about like, like they're shocked, you know? If you have, if you have $100 worth of credit in your economy, 
and you want your credit and you want your economy to grow, it's going to go to like 105, 107, something like that. If you all of a sudden say to the banks, you used to run 70, but now you can only run 50, 20 has to come from somewhere. And like people are, I mean, the fact that people are shocked is the craziest thing. Okay. So then the question is, it's coming from somewhere else. Is it risky? Is it safe? You know, and it's a very good question. Um, what are the things that make things risky? High leverage and liquidity transformation. Dollars that can be demanded today backed by long dated bonds. Those are the two things. Then you have to ask yourself in those private credit markets, do we have any of this? The answer is pretty much no. But people think because it's not regulated, it must be bad. Um, without regulation, will it stay that way? I don't know. But that's kind of the state of affairs right now. In fact, I, you can make an argument that some of the private credit products actually are stabilizing and not pro-cyclical in times of crisis. Because they're because they're the duration matches, people are unlikely to sell as prices fall. Well, they usually that they usually they usually, yeah. they're usually locked they're locked up so they can't run to the exits that quickly. But um, got a question over there. Hello, I'm Gavin Oldham. Um, let me declare a bit of an interest. I have been in the financial markets and since the mid seventies, so it takes me back quite a long way. Uh, I saw the Big Bang in London in 1986 and the merging of the capacities of uh, principal and agent, which you'll be very familiar with. I want to put it to you that financial institutions are not capable of merging the, those two capacities of, prin of principal and agent. That in fact, the, 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 uh, the motivation of self-interest or greed, which comes from principal, as opposed to the customer interest, which comes through the agent side, uh, it's not been handled by the financial side, and the result is that the greed has taken over, uh, and uh, the scale of their books built by leverage to a completely unacceptable uh, level, including using uh, vehicles which uh, are, you know, were completely new to regulators at the time. Uh, and as a result, the 2008 crash came directly out of the 20-year history of excess merging of the principal and agent roles. And that the best thing regulators could do in order to stop regulation becoming so enormous is actually to, to try and split out those two roles a bit uh, and to recognize that, that they need to be in separate hands. So did you miss a trick by not breaking up the banks? Um, so I agree. I, I agree a lot. Um, alignment. Alignment of the financial institution and the client or the financial institution and the shareholder is critical. If you don't have alignment, then you need a heck of a lot of regulation and not all of it is going to be very specific. Not all of it's going to be effective. Yeah. So what do you look for as a regulator? You look for places where things are aligned. In 2008, what was one of the things that was really not aligned? Derivatives traders were getting paid today for the value of their trades over the next 30 years. So they would get paid $100 today because the, the trade was going to be worth, you know, Three dollars a year for the next thirty-five years, but who knows what's going to happen in thirty-five years? And that caused them to want to put risk out, out in the out years and get paid today for a certainty. That was that was terrible. That kind of that kind of activity is something that regulators should be looking for all the time. Right, but would you break up the banks? Well, I mean, when you, people say break up the banks, do they mean make them smaller? They mean make them well. Some people say make them smaller. Some people say, like Gavin, separate out the money. You know, the acting on their own account as opposed to acting for clients. Well, when a bank makes a loan, it's acting on its own account, right? Banks make credit decisions. Bank funds itself with you know borrows at three percent, lends it out at five percent. They're trying to get the most secure five percent loan they can. They're they're acting. They're acting in their own interest there. Now, we all think that's great because that's stability enhancing. Like, right. So, you know. Well, I take that as a tactful no. <laughs> I think it's the have to look at the activity. Right. Now, what, what activities should and should not be in banks and, and how are they how are they exactly? We've decided in Dodd Frank that there are certain activities that shouldn't be in banks. Right. And, and we pushed them out. Into the private sector, right. 
or private capital markets. Um, I'm going to look, are there any? Yeah. I, I, I see, but I'm actually, I'm actually looking. Are there any women who want to ask questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah. okay, you get, you get that book looking so eager and enthusiastic, okay? And then I'll turn to, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll go to that one and that one, and then I'll get all the other hands as well. So one, one there, and then over to you. All right, uh, I'm Hetsi Samosir. Uh, I'm an MA, MA Mergers Acquisition Consultant at Deloitte, Switzerland. I'm also attending Masters of Sci uh, Finance program. Sorry, I'm nervous. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear what would be your advice? How we become a good, a great uh, MA expert? I, I, I'm aware that you are an, um, an expert in MA and IPO. And how did your experience from industry? Uh, help make positive impact in policy making and regulatory. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, okay. So as a polite way of saying, how how did they all become like you? Um, I, I think there's different. I think like anything in life, there are different paths you can. Um, well, one of the things to do is to is to get the opportunity to see people who are good at it do it, and they do it different ways. Like you can watch some lawyers. Like we'll talk about lawyers. Some are yellers, some are writers, you know, some are people who have quiet conversations. They, they do things different ways. Um, the second is become really adept in your field. Like if, if you want to be a financial only advisor, really understand the financial model that goes into deciding whether an MA transaction is a good one or a bad one. Like just understand it so that when people use terminology when they use jargon, you're you're never out of you're, you're never out of step. And then the last thing I would say is you gotta like it. And you got and you gotta kind of like the, the process. Um, so ask yourself that when you're in it a few years, is this something I'm really gonna like? Because the hours are long, the stress is high, and if you don't like it, that's too long and too high stress. So that's what I would say. We got a question over there. Um, I have oh, a really good question. That's okay. okay. Yep. Sorry. Sorry, I can't see. I'm gonna stand. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question isn't directly related to econ, but you said um, financial markets affect every aspect of life. So, as I'm sure you're aware, Lena Khan is currently the chair of the FTC, and they're focusing on trying to regulate some uh, generative AI and natural language processing. So I was wondering, do you think the SEC is going to get involved in helping to regulate um, big tech companies and different sort of generative AI in the next year or so? Or do you think the focus is going to go towards the FTC more so? Um, the SEC has already expressed interest, keen interest in regulating the use of generative AI and actually you know, almost all new technology in the provision of financial services. Um, and I would say they want, they're using the new developments and the way customers would interact with, with providers to add additional regulation. So very much front of mind for this, for this SEC. We, 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 the U.S., we, we, the West, we kind of need a more comprehensive approach to the use of AI. Yeah, because the EU has the AI Act. That's why I was kind of wondering, like, if you think... The FTC and the FTC are going to work together and create something like that? Or? It's just like, what are the, I don't think that the most acute risk in AI is that somebody has a model portfolio designed by ChatGPT. Like, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not a big deal. Okay? But what, what is a big deal is what kind of data sets and how, you know, how much efficacy do those data sets have? Um, are people using to generate results? Because you know, manipulating those data sets is going to drive the results, and I think that's a place where we have to be really careful. What do you think about Lena Khan, by the way? Do you do you ad admire what she's doing, or do you hate it? Um, it's very different from it's very different from the way I approached being a regulator. Indeed. Yeah, I mean. You're an administrative agency, not a not a legislative agency, not a political agency. You know, you kind of stick between the rails. And mm -hmm. if you think something's going on outside the rails, you don't like, you raise your hand and say, hey, Congress, there's something over here that you want to do something about. But, you know, look, 
Other people have the view that there's a political vacuum in the US, somebody should fill it. It's certainly an interesting moment. Um, question over there, and then we'll go to another show of hands over there. My name is Jeanne Anne, and uh, I'm a PhD student in King's, and I, I'm also a lawyer in Switzerland practicing uh, international arbitration. And my question is a little bit related to the one that has been asked, but is more abstract, I'd say. Um, so the legal systems are facing um, unprecedented and new issues, and especially because of technology. And uh, those technologies develop in a very high speed. And I was wondering um, if uh, what you think about that, if you think that um, maybe the legal system is inadequate uh, to, to tackle those kind of issues and what would you uh, recommend doing? Um, so um, I'm, I'm gonna stick to what, what I know something about, which is financial regulation. Um, do I think the legal system is inadequate um, to tackle certain developments? I, I want to believe that. Because I want to believe like, that there are principles, which is you know, we, we protect consumers. Okay. Um, we try to make we try to make things efficient. We try to have transparency and honesty so that people can, can bargain. And then we have the benefit of it. We try to support like start there and say how can we use those tools to deal with um you know generative ai and i think we can because you know what if you're gonna if you're gonna wait for new laws you're gonna win so my question so is, what if, was a little i was gonna say yeah my uh, question was more how do you use do you think a way do you see ways to use the mechanisms of the legal system fast enough to respond to the issues uh, that uh, they are facing. And for example, crypto. Does anybody remember the ICO craze? The yeah, crypto, yeah, the crypto, yeah, the yeah. crypto yeah. coins, yeah. The crypto coins and, 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 you know, we use the existing law to say, hey, this is no good. You're, you're raising money from the public. You're not, you're not giving them the protections that you're supposed to give them. And the courts agree. And, and they're they're effectively wrong. But there were people out there saying, there were lots of professors saying, "Oh no, we need new laws." We need, I was like, "By the time we get new laws, it's over." Yeah, but the existing law held up pretty well. So, would you? I mean, do you think crypto should exist today, or would you ban the whole lot? Well, crypto is a technology, and it's been applied in a whole bunch of ways. Like, where let me give you an example where crypto I think is going to emerge and be pretty powerful personal medical records. The cryptographic tokenization of personal medical records and your ability to control who gets them and who doesn't and in what way, like that's a pretty good use of that. Um, stable coin, uh, a truly stable, stable coin backed by you know, cash or anything that you would back in a bank. You know, very, very efficient way to transfer money. Um, you know, joke coin. Dogecoin. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Elon Musk no, coin. No, yes. No, no functionality. No, you know, there, so you know, it depends on where what its application is. Right. We we brought like, in addition to the ICO cases, we brought a bunch of cases stopping enforcement like, cases, dumb, basically dumb stuff. Yeah, we're almost out of time. I think we should have one question at the top. Anyone want to? Um, okay, question at the front. Okay, again, you're looking so keen. You should. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Just shout shout out loudly. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Bill. I, I studied engineering first year at University of Amsterdam. So my question is a bit simple: Should we abolish cash or not, and why? Okay, that's simple. <laughs> should we abolish cash or not, and, and why? Um, so one one of the things about cash that we all use is it's anonymous. Yeah. Okay, you have the freedom to spend thing on things you want to spend it on without someone else, maybe a bank or the government, knowing who we are. If we go to a, if we go to all digital, some entity will know every transaction. And, and the question is, as a society, are we ready to And wouldn't, wouldn't there be less corruption if we didn't have that? Right? You have to believe that the government's not corrupt. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, that's a very yeah. fascinating, thought-breaking moment to end on. I mean, my very last question I'd like to ask you, though, is this. Okay, so you were here 30 years ago. We were actually here at the same time, oddly enough, although I was an anthropologist and way too scared of economists to talk to them. <laughs> so I wouldn't have spoken to you at the time. But um, if you look back to yourself 30 years ago and look at this lot today, what advice would you give yourself back then or give the students today that you wish you'd known then and didn't? Enjoy every moment of this. <laughs> you know, come go to go to lectures, have fun, yeah, you know, enjoy it. It's I, I I look back on it so fondly. So yeah, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly nervous laughter. So everyone goes, don't worry. <laughs> Oh, well, that's a wonderful, wonderful moment to end on. So thank you very much indeed. Big round of applause. Thank you. Oh, and I forgot to I forgot to say, Kamiya, do you want to say that you get to choose the best question, I think. Yeah. Just yeah. to put you on the spot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this is this is actually Jay. This is Jay's favorite. Um, the book he recommended. It's about the future of America. Or well, tell us why you like it, Jay. It's, it's about trust. It's actually about it's actually about game theory. Yeah. It's about game theory and trust, and it's about you know the cost of trust breaking down. If you build up trust, your economic system is going to work. Build up trust, and your your economic system is going to work very well. Trust breaks down. People people don't invest in the future. They think today is a zero cycle, and your economic system fails. So I think the other message, other message we can take away is all of you who are doing economics in any shape or form, get ready to do your PhD on game theory. The second book goes to and uh, I think the China person, I mean, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, just, uh, just finally, thank you so much for visiting us. We have a small present. One is about the vision, but we talked a little bit about it. Um, the other one is anybody whose school has been involved with King's Lab. Yeah. We have a lot of Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to thank you.